Hey everyone, I'm Mr. Willis, and you will love economics. Let's say the United States economy is experiencing a recessionary gap of $500 billion. The unemployment rate is above 6% due to an increase in cyclical unemployment. The standard of living, income, and consumption levels are all in the dumps, and the economy just isn't recovering. Congress decides it's time to act, and so it begins to debate policy options to correct economic conditions and return the economy to equilibrium. Congress settles on an increase in government spending. But how much spending is needed to close the recessionary gap and return the economy to full capacity? Oh, well that's easy. A $500 billion increase in government spending should cause a $500 billion increase in real GDP output and close the GDP gap, right? If government increases expenditures by $500 billion, it'll cause the economy to go from this to this. Government officials have gone from a recessionary gap to an inflationary gap because they have failed to take into consideration the multiplier effect of consumer spending that will be generated as income increases across the economy after the policy is used. To use fiscal policy effectively, government must account for both the increase in aggregate demand caused by the initial policy itself and the aggregate demand created by the multiplier effect of consumer spending that occurs as jobs are created and income levels increase. But how can this be done? It depends entirely on how likely consumers are to spend or save their disposable income. These are known as consumer propensities. When consumers earn a new dollar of disposable income, they can either spend it or save it. There is no in-between. Maybe they spend all of it. Maybe they spend a portion of it and save the rest. Whatever is spent is spent. Whatever isn't spent is saved. And savings doesn't necessarily mean depositing the income into a bank or financial asset. If a portion of the dollar is put in a jar or lost in the cushions of your car seat, it's technically saved because, well, it isn't being injected back into the economy through consumer spending on goods and services. The marginal propensity to consume, also known as the MPC, tells economists the portion of each new dollar in disposable income that consumers will spend rather than save. The marginal propensity to consume in the economy can be calculated by taking the change in consumption divided by the change in disposable income. This will tell us the percentage of each new dollar in disposable income spent by consumers on goods and services in the economy. The marginal propensity to save, also known as the MPS, tells economists the portion of each new dollar in disposable income that consumers will save rather than spend. The marginal propensity to save in the economy is calculated by taking the change in savings divided by the change in disposable income. This will tell us the percentage of each new dollar in disposable income saved by consumers in the economy. Propensities can be expressed as either a percentage or a decimal in order to demonstrate what consumers are doing with each new dollar of their disposable income. Let's take a look. This table illustrates the consumption and savings data for country A between 2015 and 2017. We can see the disposable income levels of consumers across the economy in each year, as well as the amount of disposable income consumers spent on goods and services, and the amount of disposable income consumers saved. The first thing we need to determine is the amount by which disposable income has changed in each year. We can do this by taking the disposable income level in the current year and subtracting the disposable income level in the previous year. Next, we have to calculate the difference in consumption as disposable income changed in each year. We can do this by taking the consumption level in the current year and subtracting the consumption level in the previous year. Lastly, we have to calculate the difference in savings as disposable income changed in each year. We can do this by taking the savings level in the current year and subtracting the savings level in the previous year. Now we're ready to calculate the marginal propensity to consume and the marginal propensity to save in our economy in 2015, 2016, and 2017. In doing so, we can discover exactly what portion of each additional dollar of disposable income consumers spent and which portion they saved in each year. To calculate the MPC, we take the change in consumption and divide by the change in income in each year. In 2015, the marginal propensity to consume in country A was 0.8. This means that for every dollar of new disposable income that consumers received, they spent 80 cents on goods and services. In 2016, the marginal propensity to consume in country A was 0.75. This means that for every dollar of new disposable income that consumers received, they spent 75 cents on goods and services. In 2017, the marginal propensity to consume in country A was 0.5. 
This means that for every dollar of new disposable income that consumers received, they spent 50 cents on goods and services. Now for the marginal propensity to save. To calculate the MPS, we take the change in savings and divide by the change in income in each year. In 2015, the marginal propensity to save in country A was 0.2. This means that for every dollar of new disposable income that consumers received, they saved 20 cents. In 2016, the marginal propensity to save in country A was 0.25. This means that for every dollar of new disposable income that consumers received, they saved 25 cents. In 2017, the marginal propensity to save in country A was 0.5. This means that for every dollar of new disposable income that consumers received, they saved 50 cents. We now have a clear picture of consumer propensities in country A from 2015 to 2017. This data will prove vital to analyzing the strength of the multiplier effect and the effectiveness of fiscal policy in country A. Here's a few tips to make sure your calculations are correct. First, because consumers only use disposable income to either consume or save, total consumption and total savings should always equal total disposable income when added together. This also means that when added together, MPC and MPS will always equal one, always. This makes it really easy to use one to find the other. For example, if I told you American consumers have an MPC of 0.9, not only could you determine that they spend 90 cents of every new dollar of disposable income, but you can definitely conclude that they have an MPS of 0.1 and save the remaining 10 cents. So how can government use these propensities to calculate the level of aggregate demand created by the multiplier effect after fiscal policy is implemented? Each policy has a multiplier that can be used to calculate the exact strength of the multiplier effect that will result from fiscal policy options. When government uses fiscal policy to influence aggregate demand, it sets off a multiplier effect of job creation, which generates income and ultimately stimulates consumer spending. The strength of the multiplier and the size of the change in real GDP output that results from fiscal policy relies entirely on consumer propensities to consume and save. The higher the propensity to consume, the more consumers will spend of each new dollar in disposable income generated in the economy by the initial policy, making the multiplier effect stronger and the policy more effective. For example, let's assume that the United States Congress implements expansionary fiscal policy by increasing its expenditures by $20 billion. The purchase of $20 billion of economic goods generates revenue for firms, who then create jobs to scale production to meet higher demand, which generates disposable income for workers. Now let's assume that the American consumer's marginal propensity to consume is 0.8. Consumers will spend 80% or $16 billion of the $20 billion of new disposable income that came from the initial policy, and they will save $4 billion. This $16 billion increase in consumer spending will generate revenue for firms, who then create jobs to scale production to meet higher demand, which generates disposable income for workers. Consumers will spend 80% or $12.8 billion of the $16 billion of new disposable income that came from the additional consumer spending, and they will save $3.2 billion. This $12.8 billion increase in consumer spending will generate revenue for firms, who then create jobs to scale production to meet higher demand, which generates disposable income for workers. This wave of spending and saving will continue throughout the economy, increasing aggregate demand and boosting real GDP until there's no additional income to be generated. If we continued the process until no additional income could be generated and consumers could spend no more, we would find that the initial $20 billion increase in government expenditures initiated a multiplier effect that generated an additional $80 billion in consumer spending throughout the economy. When added together, the expansionary fiscal policy created $100 billion of real GDP output in the American economy. This process could be exhausting if it was required every time economists needed to calculate the effectiveness of fiscal policy. Lucky for us, there are shortcuts to finding the potential change in real GDP output that will come about after fiscal policy use. They're called the spending multiplier and the tax multiplier. The spending multiplier can be found by dividing one by the marginal propensity to save. Here's a quick tip to calculate in the multiplier. When dividing one by the MPS, flip the fraction. The MPS is expressed as a decimal or percentage, which can also be converted into a fraction. Simply flip the fraction upside down and you'll have your spending multiplier. Here are the most common spending multipliers paired together with the most common propensities you'll find in this course. An MPS of 0.1 will mean a spending multiplier of 10. 
An MPS of 0.2 will mean a spending multiplier of 5. An MPS of 0.25 will mean a spending multiplier of 4. An MPS of 0.4 will mean a spending multiplier of 2.5. And an MPS of 0.5 will mean a spending multiplier of 2. Once you have found the spending multiplier, you can simply take the size of the initial change in government spending and multiply it by the spending multiplier to determine the full potential change in real GDP output that can occur. For example, suppose the government of country X decides to increase its military spending by $10 billion, and the marginal propensity to save in country X is 0.25. Using the MPS, we can determine that the spending multiplier is 4 in country X. After the expansionary fiscal policy is implemented, Consumers will use the new disposable income generated by the fiscal policy to spend $30 billion on goods and services through the multiplier effect. Ultimately, a $10 billion increase in government spending leads to a $40 billion increase in real GDP output in country X. Now suppose that the government of country Y decides to decrease spending on public goods by $25 billion, and the marginal propensity to save in country Y is 0.5. Using the MPS, we can determine that the spending multiplier is 2 in country Y. After the contractionary fiscal policy is implemented, consumers will lose the disposable income that would have been generated by government expenditures, leading to a $25 billion decrease in consumer spending through the multiplier effect. Ultimately, a $25 billion decrease in government spending leads to a $50 billion decrease in real GDP output in country Y. The tax multiplier can be found by dividing the marginal propensity to consume by the marginal propensity to save. Here's a quick tip to calculating the multiplier. When dividing the MPC by the MPS, remove the decimal. Removing both decimal points makes the equation simpler and gives you a tax multiplier with less hassle. Here are the most common tax multipliers paired together with the most common propensities you'll see in this course. An MPS of 0.1 means a tax multiplier of 9. An MPS of 0.2 will mean a tax multiplier of 4. An MPS of 0.25 will mean a tax multiplier of 3. An MPS of 0.4 will mean a tax multiplier of 1.5. And an MPS of 0.5 will mean a tax multiplier of 1. Once you have determined the tax multiplier, you can simply take the size of the initial change in tax policy and multiply it by the tax multiplier to determine the full potential change in real GDP output that can occur. For example, Suppose the government of country A decides to decrease personal income taxes by $10 billion, and the marginal propensity to save in country A is 0.1. Using the MPS, we can determine that the tax multiplier is 9 in country A. After the expansionary fiscal policy is implemented, consumers will use their disposable income generated by the fiscal policy to spend $90 billion on goods and services through the multiplier effect. Ultimately, a $10 billion decrease in personal income taxes leads to a $90 billion increase in real GDP output in country A. Now suppose that the government of country B decides to increase personal income taxes by $100 billion, and the marginal propensity to save in country B is 0.4. Using the MPS, we can determine that the tax multiplier is 1.5 in country B. After the contractionary fiscal policy is implemented, consumers will lose disposable income now that taxes have increased leading to a $150 billion decrease in consumer spending through the multiplier effect. Ultimately, a $100 billion increase in personal taxes leads to a $150 billion decrease in real GDP output in country B. A couple of things left to note. Look at this side-by-side -side comparison of the spending multipliers and tax multipliers that were listed earlier. With the same propensities, every single spending multiplier is greater than every single tax multiplier by one. But why? What does this mean? It means that, dollar for dollar, the spending multiplier is stronger than the tax multiplier, and spending policy is more effective than tax policy. But why? It's all about consumers' marginal propensity to save. When government is given a dollar to spend, it spends every red cent. Heck, it even tends to spend more. However, when consumers are given a dollar of disposable income, they have a propensity to save a portion of it according to their MPS. When a portion of disposable income is saved and not spent, it weakens the multiplier effect and the potential for real GDP growth. You can also see a correlation between the size of the marginal propensity to consume and the strength of the multipliers. When the value of the MPC is greater and consumers spend more of every new dollar, fiscal policy is stronger and more effective 
because the multiplier effect has more impact. When the value of the MPC is smaller and consumers spend less of every new dollar, fiscal policy is weaker and less effective because the multiplier effect has less impact. As a result, government wants to encourage conditions that boost consumer confidence and get consumers to be more active causing policy to be more effective in enacting change in the aggregate economy. And that's propensities and multipliers. Be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red button below so you can receive alerts about new videos when they become available. If you enjoy the channel or find my videos useful, let me know by liking the video and feel free to leave a comment below. We have full video lectures on every topic in macro and microeconomics, as well as quick macro micro minute videos for cram sessions and quick reviews. If you'd like to learn more, you can click here for my macro minute video on the spending multiplier, or you can click here for my macro minute video on the tax multiplier. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time on You Will Love Economics.